Simple Cyber Defense Security Updates Interview with the Pop Historian. Welcome back to Simple Cyber Defense. In this week's episode, we're going to have an interview with a pop historian, and we're going to go over some cybersecurity things with militaries and other things. And so let's begin. So could you tell us a little bit about your background and a little bit about yourself so that we can understand what experiences you have to give to us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I go by the pop historian online. Um, I joined the military when I was 18, uh, went right into IT for the uh, 3D OX2 field, which I believe was um, cyber systems operations uh, for the first four years of my career. Um, I was in off at Nebraska, where I handled the SAC system, Strategic Automated Command and Control System. I was one of the main operators on that. It is a system that was developed back, I wanna say in 65, maybe 66. Um, and still used eight and a half inch floppy disks that couldn't even hold a picture of themselves. Um, after that, I moved to Turkey for a year, um, assisting with the fight against ISIS. Um, and from there, got out uh, and worked in uh, the academic side a little bit, um, and then uh, the customer service. And then I'm back to uh, the kind of commercial side of it as well. I'm working with um, a system called OnBase, which is Epic adjacent, used uh, in a lot of hospitals. Okay. So with that experience, what would you think would be the craziest cybersecurity story that you have? That it, it, it would probably be less about the cybersecurity aspect of it and more about the physical aspect of it. Mm -hmm. When I was in the military, I was working on you know, the machines were the size of refrigerators. Um, you know, they give you hearing loss if you stay too close. Uh, the biggest thing that we were concerned about was people actually getting into the physical system because there was no way to essentially hack it remotely. Uh, the parts just weren't there. Um, so we'd have to do, I think, weekly changes of the door locks. And we had this one dude who would just yell down the hall every single time what it was. And then we have to change it again. We end up being two or three times a week. So. Nothing too crazy, but it was a lot more of a physical security side rather than the uh, electronic. Okay. So you're touching on the physical security. So I always teach that there's different levels of security. So how important do you think physical security is based upon like other factors of security? Uh, physical security is always, in my experience, going to be one your your first and foremost, um, because once they have your machine or access to your machine, physical access, they can run whatever they want to on it. Um, in practical terms, yeah, maybe running a uh, you know um, brute force attempt to unlock a password isn't going to work if you're able to make seemingly infinite clones of that because you have access to the original information, um, then you're going to have a much easier time using whatever systems that you might have, um, even if they are not the best systems. So making sure that you have access over your stuff, uh, physical access that can be locks, um, that can be make sure that it's close to your person, putting it in a safe and secure place. Uh, that's going to be number one. Okay. Um, so would you be, mind just tell us more about this like floppy disk thing that you're talking about and how that would be like a security that's unhackable as you called it yeah definitely so the idea behind it is that it was one of the first uh computer systems it actually predates arpanet um and it was actually i believe one of the first uh nodes that was included with arpanet back in the 70s the idea or uh, the big reason that it's still maintained is that it has um 99.99 percent uptime um, it's still integrated as a last line of defense with some of our nuclear ICBM assets, um, as well as some of our bomber wings, um, and it can get a message in two to three seconds, as it would be opposed to doing it um, hours over the phone or um, trying to get that transferred in person. Um, the biggest advantage of it, the reason that it's quote unquote unhackable, 
is because any changes or modifications you want to take place, you want to take place to the system have to be conducted in person. Um, you have to manually load your, your boot disk, and then you have to switch that out and manually load your dump file. So that way, wow. when it eventually will break, because the system, you know, it's over 50 years old at this point, mm -hmm. will break. All that information is kept in there. <clears throat> um, you would have individual sections um, with each pieces of this uh you know, basic operating system, as well as that uh, storage information. So if you really wanted to make a change on it, you couldn't from another machine. The only thing you could do from another machine um, is send a message. Okay. So with that said, how do you think the average user could use something? Could, all right, let me try to put it. Do you think that the average user could use something like this in their everyday lives or you think this is just a military uh, tool that's only available to them so this is definitely a legacy system i think the underlying principles could definitely be used a lot more in the everyday life um something like maintain uh offline copies was definitely a big one um maintaining that physical security again um, and then making sure that you have systems in place that would prevent people from being able to access your machines not just through physical security but whether that be uh, you know multi-factor authentication and i know that's kind of just a basic sort of everybody's going to suggest that but i think that really really that's going to be the base if you're trying to apply this to everybody um when you're when you're kind of looking at the bigger system as a whole then yeah it's, it's definitely a legacy system and you're going to have a lot of trouble trying to implement this in any sense in your daily life because um, the hardware just doesn't exist anymore mm -hmm. um, and even if the hardware did exist the kinds of applications that people are trying to do even on an individual level with like a smartphone um, it, it's so far beyond the processing power of these machines um, you know I think that even when these were available, they weren't used for, you know, deciding moon landings. I think a lot of that was done by hand simply because you could get a lot more of what you needed as a result of that. Okay. Um, so with that said, um, that's where I want to go with this. All right, so with the physical security, I know with a lot of two-factor authentications, they have like uh, these QR codes. Uh, so with this physical security, do you suggest like printing off those QR codes or do you think that there should be some other methods that should be done? I think the printing off of the QR codes, one of the, one of the issues with that is that it's gonna move through the printer um, and then that, information is going to be saved on that machine as well. Um, I think the physical security is more in denying people physical access to your stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think, like I said, that's that's very basic in the sense that, it, that we would consider security. Um, it's something like finding out which of the locks that you have available to you are going to work well. Um, you know, there's a pretty good channel on, on YouTube called The Lockpicking Lawyer. I'm not sure if you've ever seen his work. Yeah, I but see. you've seen it. So yeah, he goes through and he, he picks the locks consistently and he shows like, these are poor quality locks. This is the kind of stuff that you aren't going to want to use. Um, that also entails updating your passwords consistently, um, making sure that something that has been used, uh, you know, for three years, might need to get updated because that could have fallen out at any point in time okay um so is there any other device or any other um, suggestions with like devices that you think would increase people's securities or do you think just having like a smartphone is good enough to get started with this kind of security and you can definitely use it with a smartphone. One of the big benefits of it is that you have a lot um, more of, say, the analog options, whether that be somebody calling you or sending mm -hmm. over a text, um, which 
they might not, or whoever might be trying to uh, access your machines wouldn't have access to, you know, unless they were, say, recording all your calls or something like that, in which case there are certain built-in security systems. Um, but using other devices as well, uh, maybe having a backup email that you would be, um, you'd be able to recover other pieces from as well. Uh, that would be definitely something that I'd advise kind of getting involved into. Um, a lot of these, these underlying concepts have become much more prevalent in kind of the IT world and especially in the security world. Um, and there's with good reason that they have. I mean, this is a lot of like, the basic sort of stuff that you'll see on those yearly trainings that you go through for work um, yeah. that everybody's kind of being told to go through at this point um, because it's it works and it's uh, one of the most important things that you can do. People are looking for the failures within the system, looking for the people that aren't maintaining this stuff um, mm -hmm. as a backdoor, as a way to get in. So the one biggest misconception I've seen with most uh, average people is that cybersecurity is this unreachable, impossible thing for me to get started and or even to do. What do you say for that kind of attitude that people have? I definitely understand where that attitude can come from. Um, I used to be licensed for S plus, which is uh, through CompTIA. It's one of the licensing agencies that kind of shows that you, you know what you're talking about. Um, the problem is that that was in 2013. So now 10 years later, a lot of that stuff is out of date. Um, so it can definitely feel, even for people actively working within the IT field, um, really unachievable um, to kind of get into that. I'd say definitely uh, it's possible to get started and it's possible to get uh, knowledgeable at even like a layman's terms. Um, we're not talking, you're trying to get into the field. If you're trying to get into the field, I think that'd be a little bit different. If you're just trying to understand what's going on, there are a lot of resources on YouTube that unfortunately I can't point to um, at this time, but there's a lot of knowledge out there. There's a lot of people trying to make sure that you are able to keep your information safe and secure. Um, and there's a lot of best practices as well that you can engage in as well. Okay. So Touching on that best practices, what do you think are like the three easiest best practices that people can start doing today to increase their security? Yep. So part one is definitely maintain that physical security that I've kind of harped on a little bit earlier. That means uh, making sure that your stuff is nice, close, safe to you, making sure that you're not including, say, your social security card in your wallet. Um, would be a good example in the event that something is stolen, make sure that all your information isn't, isn't going to be there. Um, number two is make sure that any thing that you're going to be using regularly has multi-factor authentication. What that's going to mean is you type in your password for your email, and then maybe you get a call that says, hey, this is the number that they're trying to, or this is the number that you're going to need to put in to ensure that you have access to your machine. Um, that's something I use a lot. Um, and it's become so much easier with smartphones to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I think um, for the third thing is to really understand, um, I guess, where the, uh, the human interaction section of that comes in. If somebody you know gives you a call and says, hi, I'm so-and-so from so-and-so. I mean, I get these calls sometimes two or three a day. Um, I never provide them with any information that they don't give me. Um, they have to say who they are and what they're calling about. And um, if they're not willing to work with me on that, then there's a very good chance they're trying to get something from me uh, that I don't want to give. Okay. So I think this is all good information. So would you say that the physical security would be like the first layer or would you say it's like the last layer? How would you rate that physical security in there? Uh, physical security would be the first layer. Don't give people access to something if, they don't need if, if you don't want to lose it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's why you lock your house at night. You know, it's not because um, there's random people trying to, you know, do whatever it might be to break in and steal everything. But every now and then there might be somebody who comes along and tries to jiggle the handle and see yeah. if it's open. Yeah, it's a good analogy. Yeah. And You're never going to be able to uh, break a somebody's really trying to get in there. 
but you're not trying to do that. You're not, you're not trying to stop a professional from hacking everything. You're trying to stop the random yeah. people who uh, are trying to jiggle doorknobs. Yeah. And we don't really have the full capabilities of what they could do. Cause like I say, if someone really wants to hack you with enough time and resources, they're going to do it anyway. So I think that was all good. Is there any other last minute device, uh, advice that you want to give before we sign off? Or? Any other advice? Um, yeah, be careful with social media, I think is, is the big yeah. one. And unfortunately, I don't have a lot to say that I don't think can already be said or probably has already been said on your your podcast. And I think it's because one of the one of the great things about uh, kind of as the internet's changing, more and more people who are knowledgeable about these topics are trying to get in and share that information. Yeah. Like I said, I, I kind of cringe when people overshare on social media, like when they do these like little things like where's your mother's maiden name and mix it with your street they grew up and that's your name for something but then they don't realize that that could be used against you in a social media attack where they could take all that information and go to those questions of recovery questions like okay where was you born what street you what mother's maiden name all that information is freely given so i definitely think that's really good advice and i i do agree physical security is probably the only thing that everybody has control over. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that would be the biggest thing. Um, yeah, I actually agree with that 100%. <laughs> yeah. All right. So before we sign off, um, do you want to tell people where they can find you online? So yeah. If they want to have more information. Yeah, so currently I'm making a historical, short historical documentaries. I've always had a passion for history. Um, I really think that people love learning about history. I just don't think that it's taught as well in schools. Um, you can find me on YouTube as The Pop Historian. Uh, there's going to be two of them. If you go to the one with Red Dead Redemption gameplay, that's not me. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that you, uh, if I could send you over a link just to uh, include that below, that'd be great. Yeah, um, I'll do that. Perfect. And uh yeah, that's where you can find me. Um, I'm cool. currently doing a piece on the history of writing, you know, papyrus, clay tablets, that sort of thing. I already have part one out, should have part two out within the next week or two. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us and giving us your perspective on security. Um, so you can always find us on all the many, many social medias out there and also find Pop Historian here too. And with that said, Good luck and keep all your securities <laughs> safe. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Simple Cyber Defense Security Updates. Join us next time when we dive into more security issues and make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Plus, if you have a topic suggestion or want to support the podcast, stop by our website at simplecyberdefense.com.